you were here earlier, you know my name is Karina Becker. Uh, I voice many different characters. I've been an actor since I was eight years old, professionally. Um, so that's over 20 years now because I'm old. Um, <laughs> take acting classes. The answer is like an hour long conversation to get actual specifics instead of just, just take voice acting classes, which I can understand if you are somebody that wants to get into this industry. That's kind of a frustrating answer. Um, but I can tell you that from my position, the reason why we give that answer is because it literally is an hour long conversation where there's so many points to go over. And unfortunately, not every voice actor has that time in the day to do that to every single person individually who asks us that question. So the short answer always is take voice acting lessons. So I'm here today with this panel to basically bridge that gap and give you that hour long conversation so that you guys have more specifics and know a little bit more so that you have an actual starting point rather than just take <laughs> just take acting classes. Um, That's the easy answer. That is the easy answer. It's the simplest answer. It's the, the again, the reason why we give that is because we don't have the time of day to literally list. And most for, classes will give you this information that we're going to tell you anyways. So it will be repeated, and that's a good thing because that means they know what they're talking about. Um, generally speaking, when I tell people to, to take voice acting classes, what I actually mean is, and I usually try to actually give this little bit of information. Take voice acting classes from a teacher who is currently working. Because if they're not currently working, how are they going to help you work? Good question, right? Um, <laughs> if, if you have somebody that was big back in the 90s, that's great. We're not in the 90s anymore. I am speaking because again, when I was eight years old, it was the 90s. We did not do the same things that we did back in the 90s. I would get blacklisted for the things that I did back in the 90s to get into the industry versus now. Now it's a whole different story. Now we have technology. Now we have a lot more ways to even broaden our horizons with this industry. And let me also preface, there's no one correct way to get into the industry, but there is very many wrong ways. <laughs> and I wanna keep you from doing that because I wanna keep you in a good direction versus a bad one. <laughs> A lot of times it's easier to give the don't do this list as opposed to the to, You should do all of this, <laughs> yeah. but I can definitely list don't do X, Y, Z because those will get you blacklisted before you even get started. Um, so um, you want somebody who's currently working in the industry. You also want to make sure that they are getting the type of roles that you are actually looking for. Because I know plenty of people that have worked in the industry and been a voice actor for years. They've also only done Walla. Pretty sure you guys don't want to be the background characters in a dub, especially because Walla doesn't pay that well at all. If anime already pays terribly, Walla pays the worst. I would like you guys to get like named character roles. <laughs> um, so you want to make sure that they're booking characters that you actually aspire to be. Um, so when you're looking at teachers to go to, making sure they currently work, making sure that they are getting those roles that you want. Also. Make sure that they've been consistently working for the past five to 10 years. 10 is even better, further is even better than that, but five to 10 specifically is a good amount of time where I'm like, no, they've been working consistently. So that means that one big character they got wasn't a fluke, you know? <laughs> and but by the way, when I say big character, it doesn't necessarily mean they were the lead, but just a named character consistently a lot of the time. That's all you need. Um, and I have suggestions for teachers, mind you, the industry has changed a lot, especially because of the pandemic, which has actually been in people's favor if you want to work in this industry, because a lot of acting classes that were only for LA people, like you literally, if you wanted to take a class in LA, you had to be there or fly there. Now they're doing them all online. So every single teacher that I mentioned today all have online classes. I'm one of them. I teach over Zoom. Um, a lot of teachers do. Uh, and uh, so I, I'm a teacher that teaches online. Charlie Adler is one of my favorites. I love him. And um, he definitely works more for video games and original animation, but honestly, just any information that he can get you. He's gotten me more anime jobs than any other teacher I have, and he doesn't even do anime. So there you go. That's true.
Charlie ever done an anime ever? He has a long time ago. Was it like Excel he's, he's Saga era? No, he's done Ghibli. Okay, I, I mean, he yeah, wasn't I mean, any main yeah. character in Ghibli, but he's always like those random little. I was creatures. about to be like, does that count? But yeah. I yes, it, it counts, does. you it jerk. Counts. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Ghibli is a different breed. Like it's still anime. Even Mizaki is oh Mizaki is like anime was a mistake. I don't associate <laughs> myself with that cringe. cringe. You can shut your mouth. Um, I'm not. Charlie Adler, great. Crispin Freeman works in both original animation video games and anime. He uh, he teaches online. Debbie Derryberry, she's in Genshin with me. She was Jimmy Neutron. She's amazing. Richard Horvitz. Horvitz. She's also he, Zatch Bell. Oh yeah, that's right. Oh my gosh, that's Zatch right. Bell. Dude. Somebody just mentioned that the other day to us, and I was like, wow, that brings wow. me back. Just brought me back. Love Zatch Bell. I'm so old. Still uh, stands season three. <laughs> you know, well, they're working on a new. On well, no, I'm talking about dub. They never dubbed season three. Oh, that's right. Oh yeah, but we are getting new Zatch Bell. Oh. Yeah. Will they dub it? Oh. <laughs> that's the real question. Um, uh, um, uh, um. Uh, Richard Horvitz, he was Invader Zim. He was one of the beavers in Angry Beavers. He's done a lot of stuff. Um, he's currently doing Hell of a Boss. Um, yeah, he's one of the main characters in that. Um, uh, and then also, specifically to learn dubbing itself, Adventures in Voice Acting is um, classes that are run by a studio out in LA called Bang Zoom. Bang Zoom, of course, does a lot of dubs. One of which being One Punch Man, which I'm in. They also um, they do dubbing for Demon series. Slayer. They are the ones that um, facilitate that. They also they have those classes, and they do go over dubbing specifically so that you can learn how to dub. Because I'm going to tell you right now, well, dubbing, hmm, it's not it easy. doesn't pay great, but uh, it's the hardest to do. <laughs> so that's. Why? And yet everyone wants to do it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, so you want to do the hardest well, thing because, in voice because acting fans and get really paid care the least. The dubs, not in, like, it's funny. Fans care more about dubs than they do original animation. I'm like, okay. But original animation pays great money, and dubbing pays nothing. Whatever. Uh, I think that should be flip flop, but whatever. Again, I, I'm like, the harder thing should pay you more. What? Whatever. Um, but yeah, it, uh, Adventures of Voice Acting specifically goes over dubbing. Um, they have uh, Julie Magdalena, she teaches character development, while Tony Oliver, who's one of the teachers there, he will actually teach you how to match the lip flaps to picture and stuff like that. Um, also, vo uh, VoicesVoiceCasting.com, yep. Mary, Mary, um, Mary Lynn, Lynn Weissner, she's a great teacher, she also does casting herself, she also does classes with casting directors. And that's a great way for you to get seen. Now, if you take a class with a casting director, please do not <laughs> go in that class to learn. If you want to impress the casting director, if you're ever taking a class in front of a casting director, the way you impress them is that you be there to learn. Um, you will find that the people in the class that are already trying to push, how do I get on your roster? Hey, how do I get on your roster? Hey, I know we're in a class I'm supposed to learn from you, but how do I get on your roster? That's Don't do that. You're getting blacklisted, and they will not want you on their roster, no matter how good you are. If, if you are there to... But if you are there to learn, yeah. and actually learn, they like that. They like to see students that are eager to just learn, and then they will find you. Yeah, they don't have go in email. trying to get noticed. They have your email from the class. They'll find you at that point. If you come in, I'll notice me, senpai. <laughs> <laughs> they will not be about that. They will see right through it. Don't, don't do that. Go in to learn and have a good time. Exactly. Um, but yeah, Mary Lynn Meister, she also teaches classes herself. She's also a great coach, um, been in the industry forever and has constantly been working forever. Those are the few teachers that I suggest. There are, of course, more, and I told you exactly how to like pretty much figure out which teachers you want to go with. Um, oh, actually, J. Michael Tatum, Brandon McKinnon's oh, yeah. husband, he teaches. Yeah. J. Michael Tatum, he teaches. He does a writing class. Oh, Chris Hackney teaches too now. Oh yeah, uh, so does Cassandra Morris. Cassandra Lee Morris also teaches. Yeah, there's many, and they all teach online, so you don't even have to be in LA. You just have to might fix the hours a little bit, because yeah, obviously it's LA time. Um, <laughs> so, those are the classes that I technically suggest, um, and that's what I'm talking about when I say go take classes. Uh, 
um, the next parts about how to actually get your foot in the door in the industry are what you're going to learn hopefully in those classes or you usually end up learning at some point in those classes depending on where you are in your life. Um, first and foremost is that uh, it's funny because we actually were just at a comic war in Lambda and I, everybody knows that as, or most people know, I should say most because not everybody, but most people know that you need a demo to get in the industry and then they're like, Karina, I've never voiced anything, how do I even make a demo? Well, lucky you, a demo is never of any voice you've actually done. It's not, you literally don't have to have any experience professionally as a voice actor to make a demo. Now that being said, there are two ways to make a demo. One's that one is one that you do yourself and one that is done professionally. Don't get the professional one until you are ready for it. And the reason why I say that is because a professional demo costs at least $1,000. That's a lot of money. And a demo should last you at least five years. If you get a professional demo done before you're ready for it, by the time you go through classes and get more experience as a voice actor through classes, you're gonna be a better voice actor in three months and then you're gonna be like, well, that demo's trash now. And you just wasted $1,000. Wait for a professional demo. That being said, make your own right now, specifically because for a lot of online indie game projects where they are, booking voice actors and paying them, they for some reason require a demo because they think in their mind you're not a real voice actor unless you have a demo, which is false. I know plenty of people that have made it without a demo. Zeno Robinson. Zeno Robinson didn't have a demo until 2017. Hero. He's been in the industry since 2000, uh, 2006, professionally. He did not have a demo until like two years ago. And the reason why was because he specifically wanted to get into anime. He, just wanted anime. <laughs> he was already working for Disney My and making bank working for Disney. <laughs> and he was like, you know what would be really great though? Mm, I know I'm making enough to buy a house in Los Angeles through Disney, but I really want to do anime. <laughs> He's like, man, I just want to be on Demon Slayer <laughs> or like My Hero or That's something. That's literally like, how Okay, Zeno, you know, calm down. Yeah, and, then and so then he made a demo. Yeah. But he was a very professional, or like, successful professional voice actor without one. But generally speaking, again, as I said, there's no one right way into the industry, but generally speaking, this is kind of the path you take. Now when you're making your own demo at home, what I always say is, cause you're gonna be like, okay, well, I have no idea what type of characters to put on there or anything like that. First character on your demo should be close to your natural tone, your natural voice, whatever character that is. It should be close to that. Um, if you start off a character demo immediately into a very charactery voice, it's it's just not the style anymore. We used to do that a while ago, right? Well, it was, that was that was the hip thing. That was the like, hip thing like Tunes ten years ago, or no, yeah, play. fifteen years ago yeah. with Looney Tunes and everything like that. But nowadays, they're like, no, we want to hear your natural voice first, so that way when you get into the charactery stuff and the rest of the demo, we're like, oh my god. They, that's their natural tone, and then they do that? Huh. That's well, crazy. And it's great, because like most actors get booked off their natural voice most more than anything else. You will get else. most of your work off of natural stuff. I know I'm Paimon. That's what I'm most known for. Most of the stuff I book is this voice. Most of that. Right here. That's it. And that's generally speaking. Um, so natural voice first, so that way you can impress them with all the crazy stuff you can do with your voice afterwards. Now you might even say, Karina, I can't make different voices. Great, neither can Bryce Pattenbrook. And yet, <laughs> he works all the time. You can make a different character and it doesn't mean you have to change the voice itself. It could just be a different attitude. It could be different words, different feeling. Yeah, it's funny because Bryce sounds the same in everything he does. Bryce is just here all the time. Unless he's Aaron Yeager and then he's here all the time. <laughs> oh my god, a slight difference. But vocally, vocally he's the same, but I still can tell the difference between each and every one of his characters based off the attitude alone, because that's what an actor does. So you don't need to have a crazy amount of range. You don't need to be able to do a Paimon voice and then all of a sudden sound like Allegra as Beto, you know, the next minute. Yeah. Now mind you, Allegra can do that, but she's insane. You don't have to though. There are plenty of actors that book off of their natural tone or very close to it all the time. And they're very successful. Um, so 
So, characters that you want to put in there, I always say, go for characters that you like. Go for characters that you personally really want to do. Why not, right? If you want to voice a certain type of character, that's a great place to start. Now, let's say, let's say you're like, I really want to be Spider-Man one day, okay? I want to voice Spider-Man. That's great. Put a Spider-Man-like character in the demo. Do not put actual Spider-Man on your demo. <laughs> if you put I am nice. Spider-Man in your demo, the casting director is going to be like, did they play Spider-Man? Look, you no, they didn't. Why is that on their demo? But <laughs> if you put a character like Spider-Man, that's totally fine. Best, best thing ever is if you can make the casting director think, huh, that sounds like a Spider-Man type character. This Parker Peterson guy sounds really good. <laughs> <laughs> But, but it sounds a lot like that type of dude. I could cast them as that type of dude. Let's give them a shot. That's what you want to elicit from that casting director. And then you're gonna be like, okay, cool. What do I say though? Great question. I have a cheat for you. Remember in the sixth grade when you had to do book reports? This is a skill you can actually use now. Remember when you had to rewrite what was said in the book in your own words? That, you do that. that. Go watch a frickin' Spider-Man episode, look at a scene that you really like, and say, okay, I can rewrite that enough so that it does, it's different enough. Don't, don't get busted by the MLA format, though. Because <laughs> you will get flagged. Change the name, change the words enough so that it's different enough. It's different, there you go. Shakespeare did the same thing, and he's famous now, so. <laughs> he, he, it was all Greek tragedies. <laughs> So you can do that, and yeah, we all did it, and we all still do it. You can absolutely do that. Also, if you're ever wondering like what a demo should sound like, it's funny. You can go to Atlas. Um, Atlas if you look up Atlas Talent on Google, and you go to their page, you can click on a thing. It has two things on top. It says like uh, uh, character, commercial, narration. Click on that character one. It has every single one of their clients, all of their demos. So it has like Alejandro Saab, it has KG Tang, it has Christina V, it has all of their demos that you can just listen to right now. They're right there. You can literally just click on every right single one. On the There's phone. hundreds of people currently in the industry, their demos, and you can be like, oh, that's what they do on a demo. Huh. The research is all right, right there. there, and yeah. it's free. <laughs> And you can look through it again. Don't copy anybody specifically, but if you if you listen to a demo, you're like, wait, that that's amazing. I want to do something like that on my demo. Again, rewrite it in your own words, make it your own, and then do it out. Um, <clears throat> demos are a great way when you don't have an agent to get into the industry. It's hard to get an agent when you don't have a lot of credits on your resume and when you're just starting out but that demo can kind of get your extra foot in the door. And if you're doing classes on top of that, that will be an extra help. So that way when you're doing classes with these, with these people that are professionals, and if they ever ask, if they say, hey, you're really good, do you have a demo? Uh, yeah, but I'm, I currently just made it myself, you know, because it's a placeholder until I get a professional one. They'll be like, send it to me anyway. Uh, I always started say you're working, working on a professional one. Yeah, just oh, always, so you mean always like a sample. even if that's like five years from now, they don't have to know. They don't have to know that timeline. <laughs> if, you, if you just say, I, don't, I made one myself, but I'm working on a professional demo currently, they'll always say, okay, great, send me the one you have now, though. There are cheats around this, guys. Don't make yourself sound like you're doing so many things when you're actually not. <laughs> are you saying like a sample reel? Like... Uh, basically, uh, that's kind of what people understand it as, but it's called a demo reel. Or a, just well, a demo. Well, yeah, that's why because it's like a placeholder before you get like a real, like a real demo. Yeah, I just call it a placeholder demo. Okay. Yeah. Because that's what they were calling it, like on Claw Casting or Claw Club. I mean, fair. Yeah, so, um, casting like Call that. Club has a lot of wrong information, though. So oh. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna call them out. I don't care. <laughs> they actively tried to say that actors shouldn't get paid as much as they do, and I was like, ha, huh, that's interesting because uh, you, they literally pay cents on the dollar for their actors. I don't trust a single studio that doesn't pay what actors are worth. So at least the standard. At least the standard. <laughs> at least the standard. 
So, when they say things, I'm like, mm. okay. I don't care. I, I really so, don't no, care. So, no fiber. <laughs> Please don't. Uh, uh, so yeah, making your uh, making your own demo until you get the money and get the experience to make your professional demo. And what I mean by experience is, of course, taking classes. By the way, if you're sitting there like, Karina, how do I even get experience? I don't have any act, like there's no professional stuff I've ever been in. Classes count as experience, guys. Even to this day, I still list on my resume classes. To this day, because even though I'm a been in this industry for 20 years, they still want to know what classes I've been in. And those classes may actually open doors for you. I have only taken Groundlings level one, and just because I have Groundlings level one on my resume, I get in so many auditions. I was just in a level one class. But because it was Groundlings, and casting director's like, oh my god, you are in Groundlings? Yes. Audition them. Karina, what are the what is the Groundlings? Oh, the Groundlings is an improv troupe. It's kind of like UCB or they, anything they, like that. They're famous. They're big they're in the Los Angeles. Yeah. Um, <laughs> nothing, no, I mean, it's like one of those things where it's like if you have trained by Charlie Adler. Yeah, if you have trained thing, by Charlie like, Adler on your resume, wouldn't that look amazing? Cool, oh, it's Charlie Adler. Um, same thing with any of the people that I mentioned. That is experience. That 100% is. Now, you like, everybody gets into this industry and is like, I want to be the main character. And yes, that is definitely the goal. Are you going to start there, though? Most likely not. It can totally happen. I'm not saying it doesn't, because it totally does sometimes. But most likely, what's going to happen is they're going to first, you know, have you do some walla, and then they can see that you can dub. And then they'll have you be in what they call incidentals. And it's basically all of those random characters that you actually see their face and they have an actual line that you hear, but they don't have a name. You're gonna do some incidentals and you can put that on your resume. Please don't put Walla on your resume. The reason why I say this is because it also comes to the on-camera world. We never put extra on our resume either. And the reason why is because at that point, for some reason in casting director's heads, now mind you, every casting director knows we have done Walla and extra work before. They just don't want to see it on our resume. It's, it's I don't know why. Noise. I kind of think it's ridiculous, but I'm just telling you how the industry works. It, it's like the white noise work. It's just this, it's the stuff that's never going to be noticed regardless. And so. at that point, when they see that on your resume, they see you as you're an extra actor or you are a walla actor. And that's it. Again, I don't agree with it, but that's the way the industry works, and I'm telling you how it is. They would much rather see on your resume the classes you've taken than Walla. They would much rather see the weird skills you have. If you can sing, if you can rap, if you can beatbox, if you can do creature noises, Whistlers. anything under your skills. Those Whistlers. Should... Just... Oh, whistle. God. Guys, oh my god. Story time, sorry. Okay, I'm working on trolls, right? <laughs> my friend Jake comes in and I was like, the heck are you doing here? And he's like, oh, I'm here to burp. <laughs> I'm not joking. This is a union job. He was there for five minutes. He burped into the microphone, the ABCs, and he made $1,000. <laughs> and he gets residuals <laughs> for burping. So if you can burp on command, put that on your freaking resume. Yeah. I'm not even joking. I, I can't tell Those you how many skills. times. No, any of like... those skills are so important. They're random skills. Uh, because, yeah, literally, Burke the ACCs is on his resume, and that's why he got called in. <laughs> because none of the other actors who were the main cast could do that, so they had him do it for them. Well, it's like they had Max beatbox for Ito. Ito. <laughs> and that wasn't in the original. They were just like, hey, you want to do it? Was just, yeah, the director yeah, was yeah. just like, hey, Max, do you still beatbox? And he's like, yeah, and he's like, come on in. You're Ito now. <laughs>
because they are considered special skills. Well, it's like cr creature voices as well. Creature voices. It's like, look, D. Bradley Baker is... <coughs> oh, I got yelled at one time by a director because they, I didn't have can sound like a cat on my resume. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, it's... It, please laugh. It's, no, it's hilarious. Like, <laughs> but that's real. Like, it's hilarious like, because they were right. They were right. <laughs> it's still not on my resume. <laughs> Damn it. No. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna fix that, I know. But it was because I was I was in there and they were like, can you sound, you can't sound like a cat. And I was like, yes I can. And they were like, why is it not on your resume? I was like, cause I didn't think about it. <laughs> and they were like, and mind you, this was a director that I worked with for a while and they were like, Karina, you teach this. What's wrong with you? <laughs> um, and then I was that cat. And then she was like, no seriously, this needs to be on your resume. You actually sound like a freaking cat. There you go. Any sort of that type of special skill that you have, that counts as experience to put it on your resume. Classes, skills you have, put that on your resume, that counts. And that looks good. Um, now, uh, resume, oh, if you happen to have any high school theater, there's a way to put high school theater on your resume without making without it look like your high school thing. theater, but you're not lying either. <laughs> Stage production of Sweeney Todd. <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, every every high school theater has done Into the Woods, right? And if you were in it, yeah, put Into the Woods. Put your character that you. This is, yeah, you usually put um, you put title of whatever you were in, then character name, and then director. You put the director's name, not the high schools, the directors. If a casting director asks, then you can tell them that it's a high school production. So you're not lying. You're just not outright giving them the truth. But that's fine. They don't need to know that information. They don't need to know that. It's just like when you say, oh, I'm working on a professional demo five years from now. We don't say that part. But it, it also makes sense because it's like they don't need to know. They don't need to know that. It's, it's extra fluff. When it comes down to it, they just want to be able to be like, can you do this? Good, go. We have all it's, made it's all our regular job resumes a little, look a little bit better, right? This is the same concept. Why would we not do it here? It's still a job. Treat it like one. That's another thing. Do treat this like a business, because it is one. Is it a lot of fun? Yes. Is it still work? Absolutely. Am I still very tired at the end of all of it? Oh, I'm so old. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> also, if, if, you, if you guys, I mean, if you're going to school, <laughs> um, school, if you want to prepare for any of this, the best thing that we consistently tell people is to take business, business-centric classes. Because you're a freelancer as a voice actor. Did you know that I could have written off so much money if I had known better and not been stupid? And I would have known that if I took a business class. Learn, mm -hmm. learn, learn your taxes. Learn, learn how, how to do, do taxes. All business learn how to write oriented things because, because all like, the classes that you take, since you're going to be an actor, that's a write off. All of the classes that you take, all of the equipment you buy, because we're going to be talking about equipment soon. Oh, yeah, we'll get to that. We will get to that. So I went over some demo stuff, some resume, resume. stuff. Oh, hmm. Once you get your demo and your resume kind of put together, you might find yourself, like as I said, you'll take some classes, hopefully, at um, um, Adventures in Voice Acting. You might find yourself in a position where, because this is what sucks about being a freelance voice actor, is that we do a lot of cold emailing. Do not call anyone. <laughs> and, and do not show up at, at a the studio. studio. Unannounced, uninvited. You will be removed. Yeah. Those are bad yeah. ideas. Do not we have an that. email now. Email saves the day. The only time you ever call anybody is if you can't find their email and how you voice it is this. You don't ask for the casting director directly. You say, hi, I'm an aspiring, um, I'm, an, uh, I'm a voice actor and I would really like to know where I can submit my demo and resume. Keep it short, sweet, to the point. And that way the person on the phone who will be a receptionist, they just will be, will be like, oh, this email. Okay, great, thanks. Bing, done. They will love you. The shorter, the better in that scenario. The complete opposite when you're actually auditioning. Usually on camera auditions, you want to stay in the room for as long as possible. But when you're just trying to get information, keep it short, sweet, to the point, because they have to work. And that's only if you can't find an email online. 
That's it. That's the only time you call them. Otherwise, you'd be surprised how many studios actually just have an email right online and nobody knows about it. Studiopolis, if you look up Studiopolis right now, which they did Sailor Moon, the redub that Viz is doing, and Crystal. They did JJK. JJK. They did JJK. Go watch the computers. It's really good. Didn't they, do um, Naruto? they did God of High School. Naruto. Naruto. Uh, their email is right on their website, which, by the way, their website still says in construction. It's been in construction for 10 years. Um, <laughs> for more than 10 years. For more than 10 years it's had that. They haven't changed it. But that email, how I got in with that studio, because that's where we recorded Somali and the Forest Spirit and some other stuff that I'm in over there. Um, I didn't have an in with them at all. I, they don't do classes with that studio. The casting director doesn't do any classes at all. But I... Just Googled it, found their website, that email was right there, and I was like, hey, what's up? <laughs> Obviously, I didn't sound that unprofessional, but that's how I got in. There you go. Um, cold emailing is, it sucks. It's very awkward. I hate it. I hate talking to people that I don't know uh, very well, and especially when it's over an email, I'm like, ah, <laughs> cool. <laughs> Um, but try to sound professional and say, say that you're a voice actor and that you would really love to um, uh, audition for them sometime. Uh, then you go over a little bit of like maybe some of the classes you've taken, um, but just little bits. Be like, Charlie Adler and this person and many more. List like two and then say many more. Um, and then say you've attached your email and your, or no, your uh, resume and your demo. Done. Again. They like it when you are direct because it saves them time. The more you can save a casting director's time, the better. Oh, that's what I forgot with demos. Demos are one minute long. One minute. If you go up to a minute 10, that's fine. If you go up to a minute 15, you are pushing it. Definitely don't do a minute 30. And then you're gonna be like, Karina, I just went on to atlas.com though and some of these cast uh, some of these actors have like five minute demos. Yeah, Steve Bloom like, is allowed. Yeah, Steve Bloom is allowed to, though, because he's Steve freaking Bloom. No one's listening to Steve Bloom's demo because he has his name. If Steve Bloom just walks into a studio, they give him 50 parts already. How many of y'all know who Steve Bloom is? A lot. Okay, that's definitely incorrect, because if I named anything, you'd be like, oh, yeah, he's uh, the Wolverine. Tom from Toonami. Tom from Toonami. Spike Spiegel. Spike Spiegel. Like, Amand and, Amand and, and, and Legend of Korra. Korra. Like, he, he has an endless list of He was in Digimon, too. He was in Naruto. Digimon. He was, he was in Naruto. He was in and Digimon. Yeah, it's, it, there's an endless resume to that man. Right. So he can have a five-minute demo. You're not at that level. I'm not even at that level. My demo is a minute and ten seconds. Uh, <laughs> so the, the closer to a minute you can keep it, the better. And really, it doesn't take that much, guys, because honestly, most of the time, the casting director doesn't listen to more than 20 seconds anyway. So why do you need anything more than a minute? Um, you, yeah, you wanna make sure that the demo is a minute. You also wanna make sure that your demo has different genres in it. So if you do something cartoony, you also need something serious. If you do something funny, you need something where you cry, you need something, where you're doing a little bit of action, you need something that's more slice of life. Um, and you're gonna also be like, I see some of these actors have like five demos. You only really need two to start out with, okay? You don't need to be spending more money than you have to. The yeah. other actors that have like five demos, the only reason why they have five demos is because they have money to throw away at this point. That's why, that's why Erica Lundek has six demos. Oh, <laughs> she doesn't need like, Four of them. Like, <laughs> no. She just has but them. But she just was bored them. and she was like, literally, you know, she said, uh, I was like, why do you have this type of demo? I was bored. <laughs> yeah, was You would just have money to be bored with? Okay, cool. Yes, she does. She does. She has a horse. She does commercials. <laughs> <laughs> no, see, here's the, here's the fun thing, too, is, is a lot of people will, don't realize is that, like, commercials. It's where you make the money. That's where you make the money. Oh, my God. You can, you can literally book <laughs> one commercial and be set for the next two years. And buy yourself right a commercial. house in Los Angeles and yeah. you're fine. Like, we made, we made the joke earlier that Liam O'Brien booked the pistachios. Pistachios whatever. commercial. And off of that... It was pistachios, get cracking. Get cracking. Those and three words, bought him a house, and then also, I believe, put his kid through college. <laughs> right. 
pretty much. <laughs> his kid that was like five at the time. Yeah. But it, but but it, it was like it was one of those commercials that that he didn't. It it just like happened, and then it ended up being a Super Bowl commercial also. So. And that pays even more money. He made so much money just off of that one. Commercials are where it's at. So the two demos that you will need. One is the character one, the other one is a commercial demo. That being said, I usually say, honestly, start off with just making yourself a character demo. When you can afford professional demos, go for the commercial one first. Because when you are approaching casting or casting or- Agencies. Agencies, more importantly, agencies, they could care less if you have a character demo, honestly. And in fact, with the agency that I got, I got my agency with a really nice professional co uh, commercial demo, which by the way, I never book commercials, so that was, a, I catfished the bike. <laughs> I catfished my agent so hard. Um, and then a car okay, character demo does. that I met my, made myself. I made that character demo myself, and I was like, hey, um, I also am working on like a professional character demo. My agent literally said, you don't need it. They do not care about anything but commercial. Now, obviously I book way more character stuff, but yeah, that commercial demo is going to get you the agent. Commercial is the money maker. And that's why I say course. once you do get that money, commercial demo first, because you can start um, really trying to get um, agencies at that point to hopefully bring you on. And then, they, and then at that point your demos don't really matter because you get um, auditions automatically just because you're with the agency. Demos still help, don't get me wrong, and you should always update your demo. Again, your demo should last you about five years and then you should update them. Unless you're Steve Bloom. Unless you're Steve Bloom. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah. Um, also, cold emailing, I mentioned cold emailing studios. You will also be cold emailing agents. Um, a really good way of checking up an agent is good, by the way, is making sure that their contract is not screwing you in the process. And believe me, there are a lot of fake agencies out there. Luckily, you guys are actually near New York, so there's a lot of true agencies out here. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. You're not far from There's that. even agencies, like Atlas actually has an office out here in New York. Mm -hmm. And they're also in LA. And they get auditions for both places for all of their clients, both um, by coastal. I mean, they, they've recorded Pokemon yeah, they recorded right Pokemon there for here like in the New last, York. up until like they still last do. year, two years ago. Technically, Technically they, they don't, don't. Oh, okay. but at the same time, they still use New York. People. Yeah, it's all, they're still using the same New York. But they are technically now oh, yeah, in LA. Like, yeah, because I thought it was. Uh, I thought they were still using that studio for all the New York people. That they was are. Oh no, they're using their own studios no, now. No, it's all their own studios. Yeah, they're all in. all the New York people set up their own studios. Yeah, ne Netflix now it. has control over Pokemon, so Netflix is. Oh, I thought it was just the, I thought it was just the streaming rights. I didn't know they had like the no. dubbing rights too. They, they have the dubbing rights. Yeah. Was like, Duarte was doing it through. When was when did I work on it? Sun I don't Moon. Sun and Moon Ultra, I think, was like yeah, the last one that. Was that was that was work. like on Disney, but it was they just had the channel rights. They didn't like mess yeah, with yeah, it. Yeah, they, no, yeah, yeah. It's now cool. it is now Netflix, the the, the, the big bad. Um, Netflix <laughs> has runs all of that now, and they do run it. It is in LA, but they do still use all of their New York, their New York talent that they had used since mm -hmm. you know yeah. since the beginning. Yeah. Um. So yeah. Demo, uh, yeah, you can start pushing for agencies and stuff like that. Um, cold emailing them is how we get most of them. But again, you can also take classes where you kind of show up, learn from them, hopefully impress them, and hopefully they'll be like, you, yeah, what's your stuff? Like, if that's what you want. Again, do not go into their classes asking to be on their roster. Show them you should be on their roster. There is a difference. And that's by taking the class and learning and really being there and present. Um, which I mentioned the uh, I mentioned voices voicecasting.com again they if you go to meet the pros there's like a little button for it they have a lot of classes with casting directors and agents they fill up fast though all of those classes are on zoom currently that might change in the future as things are starting to open up but right now most of them are on zoom so double check that it's still on zoom um, and uh, you can take classes with them. And even if you don't impress them though, if you notice that, you know, they're just not feeling you, you can ask them questions, be like, what would you think that I need to improve on and what teachers would you suggest for me? 
They love that question. If you show them that you're a smart person, they will absolutely consider you in the future because then you can come back after you've taken their advice and be like, hey, I took your advice. I took classes with this person. I started working on what you told me. I really appreciate that. Here's my new demo with the advice that you gave me. You just showed them that you learned. <laughs> like, they love that. <laughs> they love seeing your improvement. So yeah, you might, you might take a class with a casting director or an agency and you might not impress them at first. But if you're smart and you ask them the right questions on how you can improve, what teachers they suggest for you that, to work on that, and you come back later and you're like, hey, I've improved. Yeah, that's exactly what they wanna see. They love when they see actors get better. Um, agents do demos. Uh, should we talk? What time is it right now? It is. Oh, it's definitely time to talk about equipment. Um, let me begin this by saying, uh, it is expensive to do this. We're going to try to make it less expensive for you, but is it, 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 it is. I, 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 I'm not, I don't say it to scare you. Um, I say it to prepare you. Well, to prepare you because it's expensive. Um, even when we're trying to save you money. Even when we're trying to save you money. Because even if you're looking at like a really low budget type things, usually, you know, if you want decent equipment, you probably not have to spend a couple hundred dollars at minimum um, when it comes down to it. What's the most so, important thing to concentrate on first, though? So, the fun thing about being, in, being a voice actor is you kind of have to make a booth for yourself. You have to make a pseudo sound stage for yourself. Um, best way to do that if you're doing budget stuff, uh, if you have like a little walk-in closet or something like that, something with clothes because Keep clothes, the clothes, in there. clothes, uh, oh, clothes, clothes, <laughs> is really, clothes are really good soundproofing. Um, they're already there. They're it's already free. there. Use it. Yeah, yeah, free real estate. Um, uh, moving blankets, super great for making it everything really quiet. Like if, if you're in this room, like if you're hearing, hearing me speak, you can also hear my voice reflecting off the back wall. That's not good for what we do. Um, if you're gonna be on a microphone, the microphone will also pick up second Eddie's voice coming back, coming back from the other side of the wall. And that's not, that's not good. It's hard to edit, it's not fun to cut out, and it just doesn't sound as good. That's why they, at least before COVID, brought everyone in to a specific stage or a specific booth and had everyone record in the same room so that it sounded like they were in the same space. Because even different soundproofing rooms, they all sound they different all sound from each other. They all because sound they're all shaped differently, they all have different dimensions. So even just those slight differences, even though they're soundproofed the same exact way, still sound different. Yeah. Karina's booth is going to sound different from Haley's booth. It's going to sound different from the, the stage at Bang Zoom. Haley's no? booth, you can fit like five people in it. Yeah, so, Kelly's yeah. got a big chunker of a booth. <laughs> um, so the most important thing is deadening the space. So any of that reverb in the background, that's what you want to get rid of. That's the most important thing that you're like, okay, I got to get, gotta get rid of that. Um, if you have an air conditioning unit next to your mic, that's going to be a problem. That's a problem. Um, try not to be right next to stuff like that. You know, you want the room to sound as dead or quiet as possible. Um, if you um, already have a laptop or a computer, highly suggest investing into a monitor that you can just place in wherever you're recording. So that way the computer, the fan, will not be in where you are while you're recording. Yeah, computer fan um, is not fun to do. I also either. use a really <laughs> cheap, like I got myself a wireless, cheap wireless mouse, so that way I didn't even have to, oh, well now I have a more expensive one, but right. that's because it has time on space on it. Um, so I had to buy it. <laughs> uh, but a very cheap, like, um, they're, they're like 20 bucks, a wireless mouse that you can then put in there so that way it can be connected without any interference. Um, I also bought like a cheap wireless keyboard so that way computer is outside of wherever I'm recording and everything that I need to that is in where I'm recording doesn't make noise. Um, make sure that you actually get a PC monitor, not a TV monitor. TV monitors make noise. Yeah, you remember when you used to turn on the TV and it would have that high pitch kind of thing. That, the mic picks that up. Yeah, the mic picks that up. And it's um, the you're not crazy, I promise. That is a real <laughs> thing. The mic will pick it up. Yeah. 
Um, so PC monitor is what you would preferably try and get. Um, as far as like actually deadening the space in whatever you have, um, uh, yeah, moving blankets you mentioned. Moving blankets, clothes, regular blankets. If you don't have a closet that's big enough, which was my you can problem, make a, you can make a fort. Get PCB piping from Lowe's. Just put it all together, make yourself a rectangle preferably. A perfect square is gonna cause you some extra issues, so if you try to at least make it a rectangle that's better. Um, more sides is better. More sides are also better, so if you can make it not a square, like if you make it a hexagon, even better. Uh, but yeah, PVC piping, get yourself some moving blankets also at Lowe's, put that all around it, and now you got yourself a booth. And mind you, uh, Eddie, um, Anaris's booth, what was that made out of? It was a closet, I think. I actually don't know. I just know it sounded Amazing. so good. Gosh, uh, Anaris's booth, booth so was good. his favorite. And uh, yeah, she just did it out of a closet that she put moving yeah. blankets in and all that. Yeah. What about the walls? What about the ceiling and the floor? You do want that Ooh. covered? So you would, it, it, preferably you would have something covered. Um, or if, if you have carpet, even better, carpet is great soundproofing. I think the, the initial problem is that if you have parallel walls, um, it's a lot easier for the sound waves to keep continuing to ba bounce back and forth off the walls. So if you take away the parallel walls, in essence, um, that will help. So that's why it's better to have uh, a rectangle booth as opposed to a square booth, um, or even or just like more sides, like a pentagon or an hexagon or something like that. Um, sometimes it's not, always some at a certain point it doesn't matter if you go to like bang zoom or studiopolis um all of their booths are like rectangles so it's like it doesn't really matter but is if you're putting in you know thousands of dollars worth of soundproofing it doesn't really matter what you know size yeah, shape it is at that you know um, um, oh, also yeah. a good one is if you are able to actually put nails on your wall, some, sometimes people are like renting so they can't do that, but if you are able to, oh, yes. um, one of the best ways to do, and this is what a solution that Eddie had when I when we first started in the pandemic, because I was like, I don't have a booth and I don't have money for one, um, and I didn't have a closet, I didn't really have a space to make a PVC piping, what we did was in the wall behind my computer, we put up what's called vinyl mass, it's relatively inexpensive, um, uh, but it's basically rubber and it stops like the, the, um, the, uh, sound right there. It makes it sound really dead. We put that in front of me. We then put, got some liquid nails, which you can get at any Lowe's. And I bought, um, some like sound foam off of Amazon. Try to make sure the sound foam is two inches. Make it, make it thicker. Like the little, the little one, the little the one pyramids ones, that are like this thin. Unless you are literally really filling anything. in the whole room, it doesn't yeah. really do much. So two inches, if, if you can't fill up the whole room, is yeah. better. Um, yeah. Put that in like around in front of me and in the corners, corners especially, are a problem. Um, and then we got a room divider to put behind me because I was in the living room and it was wood floors. I put a moving blanket so underneath me, so that was my floor and it was a moving blanket. I put a moving blanket above me that like kind of slanted onto the room divider and then on the room divider, on individual, the individual panels of it, we put also the, the vinyl mass and then on top of that, the foam. And it actually worked pretty darn well. Considering, yeah. until I could afford an actual booth. Yeah, so, the, the, yeah, as, as we said at the beginning, the most important thing is making sure you have a treated space. Because uh, you could get a $3,000 mic like a Neumann, but if you have it in a bathroom, that Neumann's going to sound as bad as a Blue Yeti, and yeah, a Blue Yeti's it's, terrible. Yeah, you don't want to, you don't want to, yeah, please, please don't, don't be the people that jump in and just be like, you know what, I have some savings, I'm just going to go buy a super expensive mic. Please do not do that. Um, that is the worst either. mistake that everyone makes at one point or another. Don't just go buy a mic because at the end of the day, that's kind of, that you, you need a decent mic. You don't need an amazing mic. You And soundproofing is always going to be more proofing. important anyway. So if you yeah. have the mic, put it in your soundproofing. Yeah, 100%. The next so, thing that's important. Soundproofing, uh, next thing for, for beginners, and this is an audio interface. What is that? Uh, audio interface is the, the thing that you plug your microphone into. It's what controls your Not game. a USB microphone, by the way. This oh, is yes, please, mics. Please, <laughs> do, please don't go for a USB microphones. Like, if that's all you can afford, then I get it. But 
it is much, 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 much better to get an XLR microphone and a audio interface. It is a little bit more money. It, that just kind of comes with the territory. But you will sound better. It's a lot. It's a lot higher quality. And I can tell you um, right now, yeah. is if yeah, like don't get me wrong. For the indie stuff online, for any auditions for indie stuff online, yeah, your USB microphone is probably good enough as long as you got decent soundproofing. But if you're gonna start going into the professional zone, you need to have a professional setup. You do need that audio interface and XLR microphone. Yeah. Yeah. Once you once you start using it, and you may not hear it at first. So a lot of times, you kind of have to train your ears to notice it. But once files, if they're if you're on a, on a system that's not super super polished. It comes out at the end during like the mix stages because all the levels oh, are brought up way. to a different level and compressed and all that stuff. Sorry, so, yeah. speaking of saving money, do not buy Audacity. Or no, 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 Pro Tools. You don't need it. Don't, you don't need Pro Tools. Pro Tools is so expensive. You, don't need you Pro have Tools. to pay like $100 Just, a month. It's insane. It's you can fine. get Reaper for $60 and it's a one time purchase. Yeah. Like, Audacity is free. Audacity like, is free. It's fine. And then Reaper, which is a little bit better of a, uh, of a uh, digital audio um, workspace. Um, $60 one-time purchase works great I use it professionally I record Disney stuff on it so also, you guys, this, this is technically college stuff right this would be considered a college yeah, yeah. Reaper has college licenses oh so yeah you can it does. get them cheaper if you're a and college student will, you can get yeah. them even cheaper actually the college the college student thing you can get I think a lot of things cheaper for free. you can even get bikes and interfaces and stuff for cheap for Cheaper yeah, you if can. you have a college, if, if you have a college, college student, ID. Yeah. Um, that's, I think that's how I got my mic from forever. Oh, uh, <laughs> your blue mic? Uh, my blue mic that that, that died uh, this last year. Well, it was really old. Um, it was really old. Um, um, but yeah, audio interface. So audio interface, it's pretty much what controls your microphone. It tells your microphone, hey, allow this much sound in versus this much sound in. It, it's pretty much like, you're fine tuning it so that if you're loud and yelling into your microphone, it you want to make sure peak. it doesn't peak. So you turn the you turn the interface down, and it gives, keeps the signal healthy and usable. Um, but if you're too quiet, you want to turn the gain up, and then it'll still keep a keep a good healthy signal um, that While is you're usable. Um, so audio interface and a XLR mic. Um, you don't have to. Thing, super super fantastic the it, just an interface and an XLR mic is you is like the bare minimum of what us audio engineers ask when it comes to any kind of work with this stuff um, generally speaking yeah. for an audio interface baby's first audio interface is usually something like a scarlet Girl, focus so, right yeah that is pretty good especially if you're just starting out that's pretty good if you can't afford a hundred dollars more though you can get the SSL 2 and it's a lot better. It is $100 more, so if you can't spend that, I get it. But it could save you more money down the line if you just start out with the SSL2. That way you don't have to upgrade as much. I remember and that at the beginning of the yeah. pandemic, I had a Scarlet Focus. Um, I had a Scarlet, and then I had one of the XL, um, the XLR microphone I have currently is an AT2020, which is a $100 XLR microphone. That's pretty cheap. That's you know? It, it's like one of the, it's like the best. Hundred dollar, hundred ish for, dollar microphone. Yeah. That's the mic actually I have. Nice. Yeah. Um, but I had a Scarlet Focus right at first, and I was asking him, okay, I have a little bit of money right now. What should I upgrade for my microphone? And he said, no, upgrade your interface. So I got the SSL2. Um, I then did a recording the next day, and the audio engineer that I was working with was like, what? It, why do you sound better? What did you do? What mic did you get? And I was like, I didn't get a new mic. And they were like, what did you do then? I was like, oh, I'm on the SSL2 now. And they were like, that's why. I love that thing. I've had every sound engineer tell me that they love the SSL2 because for the price, it sounds really good. And he was like, your $100 microphone now sounds like a $500 microphone. So it saved me 500 bucks. Yeah, the, the interface is like, your, your preamp interface is... Pre I always make this analogy. Think of it like the car, the engine to your car. Um, your car being the microphone. Um, say you have a Honda Civic, but you put like a Corvette engine in it. It's a really You're gonna have a really Honda. dope Honda Civic, right? <laughs> As opposed to if you have a Corvette and you put the engine of a Honda Civic in it. That's a really, that's a really lame Corvette. Corvette. <laughs> 
It's the same thing with your microphone and your preamp. If you get a really good preamp, it will make your microphone microphone sound much better than it deserves to be. But if you have a Scarlett, and again, Scarlett Focusrite, great beginner interface, but if you put a $3,000 microphone on that, you just hindered your $3,000 microphone. Yeah. You made it pointless. Yeah, if you if you have a if you have a Neumann or a three, like $3,000 microphone, what's the point if you're running it through an interface that's 100 to that's like a hundred dollars. So know? start by it, it doesn't really that make sense. It's usually better to have a better interface when you're beginning as opposed to a better microphone. Because as I um, said, I'm still currently working with the AT20 That's like baby's first like XLR mic, and everybody likes it. Yeah, I, the, I most of the stuff. industry right now is running off of something that is close to the equivalent of like a Scarlet Solo for their mm -hmm. preamp, or an SSL2, or something like that. Or, and, they're, and they have like uh, AT2020 or a Rode NT1A or something like that. I'm, I know I probably sound like I'm screaming gibberish, but that's kind of how it is, yes. So an ETA, is that an Audio Technica? Yeah, yes, Audio Technica 2020, mm -hmm. yeah. And there are also different models of that specific mic. So there's like the AT2040, the AT, and then there's like 2035. 2035, yeah, there's different, there's different stuff, but there is, yeah, there's a bunch of different things. It's just, the more, the more research you put into all of this, the better. the better off you're going to end up being. Because if, this is usually where the problem, where, where I get frustrated with people specifically when they, when they start, you know, up their, their upgrading journey and stuff like that. I can tell when you did two clicks on Amazon. Um, and that tells me that you put 10 Zero minutes of work into, into your research. And Ooh. that means that I, probably can assume that you don't know how to use your equipment or know what the equipment is. Also, read the manual, please. Read the terms and service, read the conditions, all of that, please. I didn't At least realize I was plugging my microphone. I could have done irreversible oh, damage to it. You could have blew up your microphone. There's a know thing called- Know what hot plugging is and don't do it. There's a, <laughs> there's a thing, so, when, so with interfaces, there's a thing called phantom power, and it pretty much tells your mic, hey, I'm gonna give you a little boost of electricity so that way the signal is of uh, relative level. Um, I don't know how to, how to say that in English. Oh my gosh. Um, but it, it pretty much tells your microphone, hey, here's, the, here's the, the power to the microphone so that it will work at a correct level. Well, um, it, it's like the same thing if you have the phantom power on. It's like having a plug and then just plug, unplugging it instead of turning something off and unplugging. Like if you have your PlayStation and your little sibling comes and unplugs the thing, right in the you're gonna be pissed, game. right? It's the same thing with your microphone, but you know, microphones tend to be a little more pricey at certain points, and I can't tell you how many also, times I've had um, friends just destroy their microphones because they weren't careful. Um, so for the uh, the Scarlet uh, for the interface like the the red one uh -huh. like yeah. like because I have like the I have the two uh -huh. oh, point two like what's it like two two. yeah the two, the, the two point uh, zero uh, like that um like that's the second gen I believe that yeah. was, and then like like what's the difference because there's all different like I've noticed there's like a bunch of different ones that people like uh, go to like comparing like is it just the sounding be better in the interface, or is it just? Uh, it is. It is. It is. Uh, it is flexibility and control. So I don't know how to explain this. I don't you. either. Oh All I can tell I'm you like, I'm an engineer, so I'm gonna speak engineer jargon. All I can tell jargon. you is that, like, when I switched from the Scarlett to the SSL2, I'm not even a sound engineer, and I can hear the difference. So it's it's pretty much put it this way. It's like. If you are changing your levels at any point, um, better interfaces are going to have a more smooth response time and they're gonna be easier. And uh, the internal components are less likely to go bad. Um, I can't tell you how many times someone has come to me and been like, oh yeah, I have this Scarlet that's, that's you know a couple years old and, it's, and you know my system's not sounding great. And I come check out the Scarlet and I'm like, yeah, because it, you know, it's, it's it apart. old and it's falling apart. You know, this it, you paid a hundred dollars for this. I don't know what you expected. You know, if you cheap out on your things, they're gonna go. They're gonna die easier. You know, um, so that's why I usually say, if you can splurge, uh, get a better interface if you possibly can. Um, as long as you take care of your equipment, at the end of the day, it will be great. Um, if you are the kind of person that still has your PS2 discs and they still work, you'll probably be fine. Uh, <laughs> 
but yeah, it's it's kind of one of those things where the better you take care of your stuff, the better it will be. Read your directions, do your research. That is the most important thing you can do. Uh, listen to people who are in the industry uh, who will give you the things. I actually, myself um, and, a, and a group of other engineers actually put together a whole packet, um, like this 20 page packet. And it's of all about equipment and like equipment how you can set and, up your own home setup. Yeah. If you follow a man named Jeff Vicente, he has it pinned on his Twitter. Yeah. And uh, what, is, what is his, it's his Twitter is just Jeff Vicente, Jeff Vicente right? Jeff something like that. G-E-O-F-F. -F V I S E N T E. -E. -E. He yeah. has it and it's free and it's all information that they put together. Yeah. So it's all free information. Jeff is another engineer that has worked in the industry. He did like my hero academia and one piece and he works on a lot of automation projects. You know, stuff like stuff like that. So we and he helped he was one of the engineers that helped me put it together. It's a whole packet. It goes through all of this stuff that I'm saying now. Um just add a little into bit more detail. A little, yeah, a little more detail. Um but yeah, so you're gonna make your space, do what you can to deaden it, to make it soundproof, quote unquote. Um, get a decent audio interface if you can, get a decent mic if you can, do your if research. If you're worried about paying money for all of this equipment, if you have a friend that has equipment, try out your friend's stuff first. Especially oh, yeah. because like, guys, audio interfaces are pretty much the, the like, you know, gold standard, the, the more you pay for them, the better, but microphones, that's not necessarily true. You can get a really good You can get a really good mic. Microphone. I don't sound good on a Neumann. That's a $3,000 microphone, but I have a very sharp, tinny sound, and it, it's, it, 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 like, the Neumann, like, makes that, like, tenfold. Even though that's a $3,000 microphone, I don't sound as good as on that as I do on my AT2020. That being said, somebody else might not sound as good on my AT2020 rather than on a Neumann. And everyone sounds different on a different microphone. Like if I have a, I, if I have a choice in a personal things. microphone, it's going to be a different choice than Karina because we have different vocal types. Um, you know, like you, you would do well on like the same kind of mic that like Kaylee would do well on. Mm -hmm. um, but I would not because yeah. I, it's completely different vocal type. Um, also, uh, let me, uh, uh, specific, specifically, when it comes to microphones, um, please get a condenser microphone if you are looking to get into voiceover specifically. Oh, um, yeah, dynamic mic mics are great for singing, not so much yeah. for voice acting. Dynamic mics are better for like life settings because you can throw them against the wall and they won't break. Um, Condenser mics are a little more in tune to what we currently use in the voiceover community. Um, they're a little bit more present overall, um, and they are just kind of like the modern sound. Like if you hear any cartoon ever right now, they're probably all on condenser microphones. Um, I feel like I, like, I can't think of anything. Sorry, they're signing back there, and I can understand it. <laughs> so I'm like, Ugh, sorry. <laughs> keep going, keep going. I'm like... <laughs> um, but yeah, condenser microphones to, like, are better for current you. Yes. <laughs> um, Condenser microphones are better for the current climate. It's pretty much what everyone in the industry uses. Um, unless it's like a live action show, then they might use a boom mic or something mm. like that. But you don't you don't need to worry about that. If you're looking to get into voiceover specifically, get a condenser microphone. Get a condenser microphone. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I can say. Yes. Uh, real quick, can you talk about mic placement, like distance and orientation oh, yeah. from your mouth? Um, so I go over this in the in, in my packet, but usually, at least for voiceover specifically, um, we like to call it the the hang ten. Mm -hmm. Rule. Right. So about this distance. From um, from the mic or from the from, pop filter? From the pop filter though specifically. Mm -hmm. um, so a pop filter is so basically usually, helps with a lot of mouth noises. You want to get a metal one specific preferably because the nylon ones, they don't do anything. Get a metal pop right. filter. They're a little bit more expensive, but they, but a nylon one, literally, that's a waste of money. You can literally yeah, put your that. your mom's nylon socks around a like circular thing and it does the same thing. Like that's what it is. Yeah, at the at the end of the day, if you have if you have problems with like plosives and stuff like that, that's more technique than anything. Yeah, else. there the are only tricks way to truly around fix that. that is help technique. better than that nylon um, piece of trick. Sometimes a pop filter cannot save you, and there's nothing you could do. But um, if you want a more concrete number, I usually tell people six to eight inches 
from mouth to microphone. But it also depends um, on you, your voice, and your presence. Yeah. I'm loud naturally, so I go further than people do. I'm yeah. You don't even need to I'm be. Tiny, I don't need to be that close. I absolutely not. Yeah. And then especially if my character has to yell, I'm back even further. I'm always asked to step a few feet. Yeah, down. yeah. There usually we tell people if you're doing quieter stuff, like if you're whispering or something. Then you can like move that, in a little bit. You can move in a little bit on the mic. It's okay. But if you're yelling, you can come back off the mic another inch or two. And you also kind you know. of learn that as you go through the industry when you're starting to do auditions, you'll notice that and you'll be like, oh, I you can know. just step back a little bit. I don't even have to touch the gain. I can just step back a little bit yeah. and I'm good. Yeah, it's it's all it's it's all about. Putting learning. the time in and learning and going through all of the stuff. Did I cover? I think you covered. Kind of oh, all of it? yeah. Microphones, different th different things for different stuff. So try if your friend has uh, has equipment, try their stuff out first. Yeah, so if you like yeah, it. yeah. Every um, microphone is going to sound different. There are even person. some places. I know we have them in Los Angeles. They probably have them in New York here too, because there's tons of actors in New York. But blur, you can actually test out microphones before you uh, purchase them. Guitar Center. Guitar Center, Guitar Center does used it. to do that. Maybe they still do. I, they might not because of because COVID of coronavirus, right now, but, but, you know, but if anything, if it's opening up again, you might still be able. You might be able to do that again. Yeah. Where you can try out the microphone before you buy it. Mm -hmm. um, or if you really, if you don't, if you want to hear it specifically on on someone else's voice, if you look up like any microphone on on like a website, 